So I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to um, just sort of sharing the sort of audio tools I've developed in Touch Center. Um, I'll tell you a bit about myself. My name is Owen Kirby. I have a background in electroacoustic music composition. I also, this is for posterity, but I also have a uh, European passport and a Canadian passport, and I'm looking for work. So, so that's on the record for posterity there, if anybody looks at it. Here's this. Uh, huh? Oh, are they? Okay, well, I'll give them a talk. Um, yeah, so I guess the first question, um, if you've talked around a bit. Oh, okay, well, first question, I guess, would be, have you guys ever attempted um, doing audio applications in Touch Design or any sort of audio visual or strictly audio work in Touch Designer itself? Uh, has anybody here ever attempted it? You've attempted it? Yeah? What was your experience? Okay. Okay, really. Um, okay, VCA functions as in the, like saturation or just pure like add, uh, multiplying and amplifiers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, I guess we'll probably have a look at that. Um, part of the toolkit that you'll be receiving today, there's like a full synthesizer in there uh, that I call the super synth because I think it's a super synth. But and I hope you will too. But um, the thing is, previously, I mean, it was often thought like audio and touch center. Um, when I started out, I was told, why would you bother? Um, in general, because you hit a lot of caveats off the bat when you're trying to work with it. And a lot of these are um, problems that can be fixed if you know the solution. But before you know the solution, there's a lot of banging your head against the wall um, just trying to figure it out. And a lot of this has to do with sample rights, and we'll have a quick look at that. But for the purpose of this workshop, what we're really going to get into is quick overview of some of the basic techniques that'll work for audio in Touch Designer, either like just straight audio or more electronic music style applications such as sequencing um, and like um, you know making drum machines etc uh, but afterwards I just want to sort of unload um, a pretty reasonably comprehensive set of tools that together you can generate electronic music tracks with in touch signer I'm gonna have you guys just sort of play around have a good time and uh, see where that takes you personally. Like if you have your own personal aesthetic, then start designing your own patches on the synthesizer and start thinking about how you might want to incorporate this um, in your touch designer projects. And then I'll go around and answer the questions but that are more relevant to what you're trying to achieve if I have an answer for them. Um, so now is the part where I would like to wait for the adapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. That's a great idea. Let's go around the table. Yeah. Okay, so the first first row of hands. I well, I guess I got a bit of an idea, but who's sort of familiar with? Or I'm gonna, I'm you know, I'm just gonna go straight into basic um, sort of synthesizer terms, so we know what we're talking about, and then look at small demonstrative um, networks on how those are achieved in Touch Center specifically. Um, so I might as well start passing this around. Uh, just use the USB key, drop and drag and drop the whole folder, and there'll be um, the components in there. This particular file is called the. Um, oh, the the max yeah. Oh, USBs. There's no USB. Oh, okay. That's the that's that's okay. That's the future, though. Dongles. Okay. Cool. So uh, this is, like I call it, just the pamphlet. It's a bunch of overview of the basic techniques. It's not, you know, it, it, it'll get you there if you're ever having, if you're having problems or just trying to find a bouncing off point. And then the components that we'll look at afterwards sort of expand on these basic uh, concepts. So audio synthesis, traditional synthesis. Um, you're just going to look at how to build a basic synthesizer voice in sort of the traditional subtractive sense. So these are like Moogs, um, Moogs, Rollins, everything from you know the 
70s, 80s, etc. And uh, this all starts with the oscillator, which of course we have in touch signer as the oscillator, audio oscillator chop. So you've got, so the way it works, got different wave shapes, different wave shapes, shapes have different harmonic content. And then next we're going to look at how you can modify the harmonic content through the use of filters and effects. So these are some of the wave shapes, some of the audio content displayed using the audio spectrum chop. Um, it's different settings, so you can start looking at that. And in a quick overview of one of the techniques that is, I think, one of the most powerful ones in terms of just getting nice and flexible audio results in touch designer is the third input on the, uh, that's the noise, audio spectrum. Yeah, on the audio oscillator chop, because that allows you to take non-time sliced, and time slicing is, for those who are familiar with it, it just means your channel, channel number is here, they're not rolling, that means it's not time sliced, and uh, it allows you to take this non-time sliced data and play it back as a sample. So you can have full audio files here and plugging them in, or you can have the output of a generative process. So say if you start, then that's, I think that's one of the powerful places of start, um, of starting to think creatively about um, how to incorporate audio processes in touch. So you could have a geometry, output that to the computer, have your pattern, and then sonify that through the audio oscillator chop. Next up, um, you might wonder, okay, well, how do I alter the pitch? That's the first input. And then specifically, how do you get, um, how do you get MIDI notes coming in, formative as MIDI notes into recognizable pitches in the audio oscillator. So you've got a little network over here, which just scales these MIDI notes um, from zero to 12, from zero to one, and that's, uh, how do you call it? Um, just standard equal temperament tuning. And then to get A440, all you do is you set the bass frequency to 8.16667, and then your root note 60, which is A4, will correspond to 440 hertz. So you can look at the pamphlet over here if you're kind of feeling lost, but it'll all sort of be a lot easier once you have the components, you'll just sort of plug them in and have fun. Next, you've got filters. Um, and the filters are actually pretty interesting in Touch Designer. Um, they're multi-mode, which means you have different, you can filter out different parts of the harmonic content. So you have low pass, high pass, band pass, and band reject. Um, but a particularly unique feature to the filters in Touch Designer is that the slope of the filter, which is the steepness, how much harmonic content it removes um, at the set frequency, is uh, continuously variable. So this is um, this parameter here. And the fact that it goes from 24 and 12 and in between means you can start getting sounds that are a bit brighter, a bit darker, and sort of in the range of other more traditional synthesizers. Uh, Frequency modulation, if you want to change the cutoff, you want to be doing that by the second input. You have this big, so you can do it here. This is just for demonstration. So you can do it from this knob over here, filter cutoff. But every time you export to parameters, it's going to be at the frequency, the sample rate of your session. So it's always going to be at 60 frames per second. And when we're dealing with audio, that might result in audible stepping. Um, so this is, we're just going over it now. It's going to be easier in a bit, but you'll get to have a better understanding once you see it. Yeah. These are all, yeah. these are all the native nodes and these are just how to get like some sort of, this is a bit of theory and just laid out in touch center notes. I blend so that yeah. that one could be, but I'm not sure like how deep how deep and from it like from 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 a regular stuff. Are those are those just so, more yeah. advanced? So far so far they're not different. They're like mostly basic components, but then we'll look at how like how we can start using them within an audio visual network and uh, matching frame rate. So then modulation, right, so we have the filters. Modulation, you've got two big components got the LFO, so it's, this is all basic synthesizer stuff. Um, but funny enough, the LFO in Touch Designer, as far as I can tell, is identical to the audio oscillator chop. Um, again, I should look here. 
they're essentially identical components, except that one has the default sample rates of your session. So this one I could bring it back down to 60, and that would be like a default LFO. So they're essentially interchangeable if you need to. And then envelope generator. Um, so an envelope generator is used to um, produce changes in sound over time. And here you'll use the trigger chop. So it takes an input which goes from zero to one. Like you can you can look over afterwards and uh, did you get a file? Here, okay. And then sort of look over this and you'll get a better sort of theory for it. Just running through it. Um, so this is the trigger chop, and you can see how it's affecting the amplitude here. And the way we're doing it is we're just setting the math chop to multiply, and we're sending the trigger into it. So these are the values of the trigger chop at the bottom. And at the top is the result because it's multiplying this waveform over here, which I'm going to put at the bottom, and the end of result is this sound. Next up, how do we put it all together into a synth voice? You can have a look at this network, um, which, let's see, should be giving us a sound here. Or perhaps not. Oh yeah, let's go, well, let's go see. Oh yeah, device change here. No, if you have come out of the TV, that wouldn't be too bad either. But it's not. It's not. It's not coming out from. Hold on. I don't. I can't tell. There's no LED here. These are not even plugged in. Oh, are they? Let's put three, four. This is a bit of a bother here. And I can't tell if the speakers are on here. Oh, yeah, they're on. Lots of bother here. Up three, four. Source. Power. And my outputs here. Let's see. Line in. Okay, so that's a basic synthesizer voice. 
Okay, we got yeah. some sound. I think uh, it's going to be smooth sailing from here, you guys. Um, so let's close this up for now, or rather. So basic synthesizer voice. You're going to have an envelope generator here, normally called an ADSR, and that's the trigger chop we saw earlier. This receives a trigger. It sends a value from 0 to 1. We're going to multiply the output of our audio chain here, which is an oscillator being fed into a filter. Here it's a math chop, which is the amount being multiplied by the amount that the ADSR will control the filter frequency by the second input. And all this is being fed into the amplifier, which is another math chop set to combine chops multiply. And then this vibrato is an LFO being added to a bass frequency being fed into the first input of the oscillator chop. So if you wanted to add frequency control, you would do it from over here. So it's for point 0.25 and you would do it uh, using the sort of reference in the other page on how to convert MIDI notes into pitches. Oh, it's LFO to oscillator, so we can just add a value here. Okay, moving on. Polyphony, if you want to start getting polyphonic results in touch, this is a bit more advanced, but the way it'll work is that for each channel, even within the same chop, it'll generate a channel downstream. So here in terms of the triggers going out, we now have four channels at the beginner of our chain. Now we have four trigger channels. Same with the oscillator, if we have four channels going into the input, we have four oscillator channels. That's the, whoops. Same with the filter and then down the line. The difficulty here, however, is that if you're going to be taking MIDI input, MIDI, um, the output is 127 channels for each MIDI note and for all your CCs, depending on what you're doing. So you'll end up with 127 channels down the line. So that's not usable. And what you'll absolutely need is a voice allocation algorithm. Because if you just let the MIDI output, we can have a look at what that looks like here. There's a MIDI in, and I have it set up. All these channels still exist. So I'm going to do a very, I'm just going to use a trigger. And you're going to see how that's going to impact polyphony coming in. So we have way too many channels, and the cook time is just going to go up and up and up. And it's not going to be usable. So you're going to need a voice allocation algorithm. You don't need to make your own, because in the components, there's going to be one. And it's uh, very nice. Uh, okay, so that's basic synthesizer voice, right quick. Uh, next up, there's going to be effects, right? So you have some built-in effects in Touch Center already. You have the audio uh, parameter EQ, uh, parametric EQ, which you can set up to have a sort of pseudo phasing effect. Okay, so that's a quick effect that's already in Touch Center, and you can use that no problem. Uh, same with en envelope followers, you have the envelope chop, which generates a sort of curve following the dynamics of the signal, and you can apply that to an audio filter. Next up, you have a bit crusher. This is using sampling and resampling, so you can sample down and then stretch it back up, and that's both a video effect and an audio effect depending on what your sources are. Next, you've got a wave shaper, which is using the limit chop. So here I'm just going through basic operators so you can look at some techniques that you can then work around and get more dynamic results out of it. Um, so the limit chop works as a wave shaper. What you're going to do is you're going to set limits and then set it to zigzag so that the value flips back around. So here's a sine wave going in. And here's the wave shaped output. So that's another effect. Um, this and the bit crusher are pretty much as close as you can get to distortions and saturation effects in touch. There's the warp chop, which is kind of, kind of a weird one. Experiment with it. Uh, yeah, but you can start experimenting with chops, get different results. Ring modulation is when you use a math chop, you multiply a source by another source, and it creates sidebands. And then time-based effects. Um, these are things more traditionally known as like delays, reverb, flanging, etc. Um, you might think, I would like a delay in my setup, so I will reach for the delay chop. And that would seem reasonable, but it's not. A better way to do it is to get a lookup chop. So this network, you can go back to it and look at it because it's a bit complicated um, if you're just sort of getting into lookup chops and all that. 
but essentially what happens is you use a trail chop over here as your audio buffer, and then you create a lookup ramp at the buffer index that you want. You add and the num and then you create another channel to which you add the number of samples that are in 60 frames per second. Um, so in this case, we're going at 60 frames per second it's seven, and at 44.1 kilohertz, it's gonna be 735 samples per window. And then you create a ramp with that and the ramp is used to look up those values at that time. Now the additional trick is to add, this is just a trick. This is, I can't really explain it, but it seems to work if you wanna get smooth modulation between delay times and that sort of like a pitch shifting effect on traditional echoes, use the uh, delay set to one sample on one of your um, one of your two points that create your ramp. And then you can start having delays. Right? And then chorus vibrato is essentially the same thing, but you're gonna add, you're gonna modulate your delay line. So here's a sawtooth that's being chorused. Here's the that's the chorus sound. That's the sawtooth, and here is the sum. So you're gonna modulate the delay line. Next up, a classic delay is that delay line principle, but with a feedback circuit within it. And now we're gonna to come to one of the big troubleshooting things in Touch Designer with audio. Um, if you're working with audio in Touch Designer, primarily its focus is gonna be the pixel information off the screen at the end of your network always. So if you're running feedback circuits sometimes and you've got nothing that's uh, referencing it on screen, it might ignore it and you might start getting crackles and pops because it won't be high on priority. But if it traces back from a single pixel, it'll make sure it renders out that delay line. So here's a smooth delay because we're just taking some information and displaying it on screen. And the next is Flanging, it's a mix of feedback and modulation, similar to coursing. And reverb, well, reverb's for later, um, but it's the same principles. And that's it for audio generation, MIDI and sequencing, uh, the initial setup, right? Does everybody know how to set up MIDI devices initially? You go into dialogs, you go MIDI device mapper, you check your devices over here and you make sure you add them and then next time when you add a MIDI and chop, you reference the device ID, and that'll be your results. Sequencing MIDI playback. So basic principles of sequencing are two things. There are a ramp that goes from zero to one, and something to look up. Typically, a pulse chop to generate triggers. So here the lookup is very important. We're gonna go like for sequencing, it's my favorite component. Um, you set up the pulses, they have different values. The lookup goes from zero to one, and then it looks up at that pulse, which values are going on. So you wanna make sure interpolate is off, and you've got these triggers going in with different values. If you hook that up to a whole chop, you'll get those values that are held, and that'll be your amplitude. So if we listen to that example, amplitude variation here. Second example is just how you can use two different things, two different um, sequencing parameters merged together and then keep that nice and clean for two different objects here. Here's an example of using stepped channels for modulation which are going into a filter. And the last example is MIDI notes I believe. So that's being sent out to the speed parameter of the audio file in chop. So that's sequencing in a nutshell. And then you can go as complex as you want with it. Um, so one example of how you could modify your sequencing behavior is by changing the ramp itself. So here we've got a triangle wave that's being looked up. So instead of going from zero to one, we're going zero to one, back down to zero, back down to 0 0.5. That's sort of stuff you can start thinking about. How do I want my ramp behavior to work? Uh, MIDI sequencing, same principle, but if you want to format it as MIDI, you're going to need to make sure that the channels going out are the same as the channels going in. So we quickly look at a MIDI in chop. 
This is what MIDI information looks like. CH for channel, followed by the channel number, followed by N for notes, and the note number. And then same word for uh, modulation information or whatever else. Um, so the way to do that is if you've got, again, we're, these MIDI notes, these are the MIDI notes in our sequence that are stretched to the appropriate length so that they match our triggers using a stretch and a shuffle to put them all together. Now we get our velocity values and our MIDI note numbers, but we want to format them like we saw previously. So the way to do that, one way, is to use a rename chop with this expression. So channel 1n, just an arbitrary channel number, channel 1, plus the turning into a string, the integer value of the first channel of null 1. The resulting string is ch1 and 70. And then since we're just renaming the chop, the velocity value goes in as such. Um, and then here's an additional step which is maybe a bit costly, it's maybe not necessary depending on what results you're getting, but you might want to add this channel to all the MIDI note channels, that way you're sure to get a MIDI off note message as you're piping this out. If you're just sending this, then your synthesizer down the line might just get MIDI channel 1, and then get another MIDI channel 1 and never receive the zero value for that channel. So that's a troubleshooting thing as well um, if you're working with MIDI and generating MIDI notes like this. MIDI file playback, this is if you have MIDI files generated in other software and you want to play back in touch center to control things or to keep sync. It's maybe not as obvious as you'd think because a MIDI file consists of all 16 channels, all 127 notes, and all 127 CC messages when you drop it into touch center. So if you're trying to look that up, that's a lot of channels, too many channels, and it's too heavy. So you want to sort out the channels that aren't necessary. And you can do that by way of a script over here, which iterates through all the channels and through all the samples and finds out if there are any positive samples, any non-zero. Or, recently I learned, um, in a generally more useful way, you can use the delete chop to uh, select, to delete essentially, all the constant valued channels. So this means if you have a full zero channel, it'll kick it out. But, on the other hand, if you have set CCs that are important to you, it'll delete those as well. And then you look those up and you output them as MIDI. And uh, audio recording and playback, basic principle, trail chop. You might think, I want to use the record chop to record audio, but it's a trap. It's just, it's just a trap. It's not going to work. You're going to be frustrated. So the trail chop is the way to do it. Um, and typically, So typically, I would run a script which sets the trail chop to active or not, but I, I suppose you could also export it. Um, just export directly this parameter, active or not. And then here, uh, I think we skipped the parameter. Uh, here we go. That's recording audio. And here's playing audio. So the boring way to play back audio is using the audio file in. So you just drag and drop, you get an audio file, and it plays. And then you have the parameters that are default here that you can take the time to look at. Um, but that's kind of a boring way. And it's not as flexible as these other methods over here. Uh, let's go and see. Uh, oh, oh. oh, too bad. Okay, so what we're doing here instead is we're using the lookup table. So we're setting our file in, not as an audio file, but as a full file in. And now we, since we have that information, we're using an, uh, what are we using here specifically? An LFO that's set to an audio sample rate here on the sample rate menu. And it's set to ramp from 0 to 1, and we're looking up the file from 0 to 1. So the strength of this method is that you can start experimenting with the pattern of the LFO. So we can speed it up. And this is based on the sign pattern over here. So that's, I find that already more interesting.
terms of methods of uh, playing back. Audio oscillator is very simple. Again, it's using that third input of the audio oscillator. That will, okay, those references are broken, but you get the point, it's the same file. And lastly is the copy chop. The copy chop, um, the way that works is it takes a trigger, takes a non-time sliced file, and then for each trigger, it adds that time sli the file time sliced to the end of the chain. And uh, it allows you to play back overlapping files, so it might be good, but it's a case-specific use. Let's see. It's very easy to set up as well. So, so copy chop is another way to generate audio. Um, saving audio files, once you have a non-time sliced file, either you lock it, you can right click, you can save the channels, and then you can save the channels in the format that you want, wave or whatever else. Um, you can also automate that with a script, which you'll have here. So you can look at that later and then sort of see how, how you might want to save out your files. And uh, that's basically it before we get to the troubleshooting step and then we'll just start playing with stuff that works. Um, let's try it, okay. So if you can hear that, what's going in is a sign tone. What's going out is an awful mess. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we're using the export here. So especially if I go down to 30 frames per second, it might be a bit more audible. But you can hear the stepping and amplitude. That's because we made the mistake of using an export, which are locked to the session frame rate. And the solution to that is to use the inputs of the math chop and set the math to multiply. That's for sure the way to do it when it comes to multiplying signals. Um, so let's look at the second mistake. Second mistake, we've corrected the first mistake by putting the input. What's the mistake here? The mistake is the trigger itself is not at the right sample rate. So here in specify rate, it's at 60, we can set it back up to whatever rate we want, something a bit more reasonable. And we're already getting smoother results. So that's the second mistake that you can avoid making. This last one, um, is it the last one? What's the next one? Yeah, this last one's particularly brutal if you start mixing sample rates. If you start mixing sample rates, you might get one. Over here you can see the length that has rounding errors in terms of its length when it's trying to fit down the number of samples into one window in 30 frames per second. You can get rounding errors, and this will just cause mayhem down the rest of your network. And uh, that's a brutal one to look out for, but just make sure you're getting nice, um, steady sam uh, lengths of samples in your channels. Uh, last one is, oh yeah, last one is, if your numbers aren't scrolling, it's not time sliced. So make sure that Yeah, see that's a mess. So a solution to this, a lot of times, we're both a look up, same process, but a solution is to add a time slicing chop to the end of, um, of that process. So this is what happened uh, in the delay, right? If you're doing the lookup in the delay, you're gonna need to add a time slice chop, but you can have a look at that uh, later. So that's another common mistake. And those I think are the big ones that a lot of people uh, bump their head against when they're trying to do audio in touch center. And uh, now at this point, um, I think we can look at the components and you guys can start paying more or less attention as you sort of dig into them and figure them out for yourselves. Uh, so let's have a look here. Let's file a new, Wait, new, good. So these are the components. Um, one of the components, the super synth, is a skin for all these subcomponents here um, called this. I call them the synth builder components. But we're going to start at how to build a, well, a workflow out of these components. We're going to have. So I'm going to start with the master clock component, which is going to take care of our tempo operations and our ramps and our and it's going to control our sequencers down the line. There's other features um, that aren't fully developed yet, such as the root note. Um, but this is 
sort of the direction that this particular kit is going for. So we've got our master ramp, there's a tap tempo, and that sends our parent tempo over here, as well as our bars. And uh, we can hook that up to our first sequencer here. Let's go, um, let's go for a drum sequencer over here. Hooks up here. And then following the drum sequencer, we might want a drum synth. And eventually, we're going to want to mix stuff, so I'm just thinking ahead here. And I'm just going to, well, actually, I'm not going to do that right away. Audio device out. And when setting this stuff up, I like to set the audio device out uh, volume down just before, just to make sure it's going to draw my other drums to it. What do we got here? Oh. So, quick overview of the drum sequencer. I usually feed it a four bar, it's a 64 step sequencer. I feed it a four bar pattern, but you can feed it a two bar pattern. Four bar pattern, eight bar pattern, 16, however. And the basic interface is you choose your instrument. You can clear the pattern, like let's clear the kick. You can put in your values for the first 16 steps. You can copy those. You can add some variation on the 30 second steps and then copy click those and then same with the snare, I suppose. Clear that, let's just do a snare roll over here. And copy paste, and I'll start playing out. And then these are other drum parameters that you can play with, such as the pitch, decay. You can and you've got basic preset system. I don't know what's in here, but. So that's your drum synth. Uh, what else we got? A bunch of stuff. Are you guys digging into them right now or still yeah, following along? Oh yeah, audio device out. Yeah, that's always gonna be your last output. Um, pretty much, you also have your devices here and your volume and your pan. And uh, yeah, I'm going to set up the... Okay, well, you know how previously we saw how you can look up an audio file with a, uh, with a ramp? So here's another component that makes use of that, that I find pretty nifty. So you got parameters for slices, for stuttering. And you can restore order. You can save presets over here. So let's say I like that. I change the preset for bank one. I store the preset and then uh, we can go back to it. Make some variations. like that, preset three. And there's a re-trigger input. So again, using what I think is one of the most powerful chops, you wanna use the lookup over here, use a pulse. And this is gonna be very common when you're doing all sorts of sequencing applications, even in your visuals, really cool technique. Pulse chop over here and uh, bloop, bloop, bloop. And uh, this output, you're going to turn off interplate so you get nice sharp pulses will re-trigger the input of the chop. So it's going to re-trigger every time. So that's the sort of application you can have inside a touch as well. I just also want to take a quick note for our member um, that these components will be on sale on Etsy once they're really finished up and I'm finished writing the documentation. So like you're, you know, so I'm, I'm happy you guys have them now, etc. It's just I'd rather not see them on corporate projects if you work for a large firm or whatever else. I'd rather you purchase them through Etsy at this point. Um, but I will be in touch for updates as they come out on all these components. 
Um, so let's keep filling up the four track mixer so we can get a real workflow going. Loop chopper, I, I'm not gonna want, oh yeah, loop chopper, if you're starting to look at the components already and exploring, you can look at the parameters. Um, so you have the option for video loops as well. I don't have any loaded, but I'll use the same index lookup to look up the videos. Um, yeah, let's just keep going with our studio here. Uh, mono sequencer, and then we're gonna want a synth. So this is gonna be our super synth over here. And we're gonna get the MIDI output over here. And you know what, I'm just gonna copy paste these. Everything filled up. Um, yep. One, two, three, four. So, in terms of also CPU processing, those results may vary depending on what you got. Um, yeah, are people digging into them so far? Any questions? did there. So I think meanwhile, while you guys are digging in, I'm going to give um, a small tour of the most substantial component here, which is the super synth. And we're going to use it to look at the synth builder blocks as well that are inside. Um, so first, you want to drag in your super synth component, your MIDI in. You want to make sure you've configured your MIDI devices. Dialog, I have not. So check MIDI devices, create new mapping. Um, we've got yeah, Launch Control XL coming in, Launch Control XL coming out. Um, check MIDI devices, create new mapping. MIDI in 2, MIDI out 2. Change 1. Launch right Pro, again stuff. Reset this. Media device mappers. Check media devices. There we go. And I change the after touch. This. Okay. So this is uh, audio device. Audio device out. Okay, so the Super Synth component, um, you're a one-stop shop for audio synthesis in Touch Center. Like, essentially, it's pretty powerful, so it might be a bit overwhelming if you don't know synths. Um, if you do, then I think it's pretty neat, but it essentially starts with this one module here, which you can find in your folder, Synth Builder Components, which is the voice allocator. So the voice allocation is what I was talking about earlier. If you want to manage polyphony, you need to find a way to make sure that you can limit the amount of channels that are going downstream, but that you can also assign the notes as they come into different channels. And when you're working with audio as well, you can mess around with the buffer length depending to get varying results. Okay, and um, so now, right now, we've got the voice mode set to mono, uh, but you can change the whole single path to stereo over here. And this, when you're saving presets, uh, there might be some case examples that down the line might have some complications. I haven't 
thoroughly tested it, but it, it mostly worked. So now the signal path should be stereo. You've got control over, um, so the LFOs can be stereo, so your modulation to the filter can be stereo. You can sync the BPM filter over here. Um, yeah, and then you can set the number of voices of polyphony here. So now we're gonna have duophonic, we've got an error. Fun thing about doing the audio directly in touch center is you can just stay in touch center and troubleshoot what the error is. So now the parameter filter error, it's an unsupported operand type. It's because of this expression here. Okay, so we can just chop. So now I've got two voice polyphony, four voice, again. Yeah, this was a bit one of the more complicated parts. So uh, I guess I forgot to mention this when dealing with polyphony. So a lot of objects in Touch Center have a Chan index class, which means that you can, using Python per channel, do modifications. Some objects do not have them. Um, so here, I was trying to find a clever way of um, making sure that I could get polyphonic filter resonance modulation, um, but there's a bit of something to, to troubleshoot now on the patch changes going over here. Uh, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, and the other typical error you'll get when you're just loading this stuff is your wavetable folders. All your folders over here are gonna vary depending. So that's like a typical error, is you wanna make sure that your references to your sample folders are good here in the global um, setup. So typically you can also, if you just re-recall the wavetable things, you'll get rid of the error. And as you start adding components, uh, what will inevitably happen is you'll start getting crackling and uh, breakups when you're working in the network editor. That's just the breaks. That's how it is. Normally, if you're optimizing your network, as soon as you go back into perform mode, you should be able to get smooth, seamless audio. Um, and it also depends on how much you scale this stuff. So now we've got four voices, each with four voice of unisons and two oscillators. So it's a bit of a bit of a thick patch. So that might be a bit more demanding. And um, fun things for those who know. So aftertouch is polyphonic. So let's see if we can make the... Yeah, so now only one of those voices is going. So that for me is an exciting thing to do with audio visual stuff and instancing particularly because we can start getting, um, that's what would set this apart than running a VST from Ableton is you can have access to the modulation information per voice and inside the architecture of the synth itself. So we could get the panning information per voice within the synth. So that would be a big thing. Um, yeah, and uh, we can then, if we just wanna play with this, say we hooked up a keyboard and that's gonna be our sort of audio visual instrument, playing the keyboard and we're having visuals go up. Thanks. Um, Maybe we might want to add a reverb and a delay. So to do the effects mix, you can use the cross chop set over here and uh, set that 0 0.5 to get a 50-50 mix of the wet signal and the dry signal. And it's important not to forget um, what I mentioned earlier about using these feedback circuits and needing pixel information for touch signer to refer to. So we also place our top here. Let's get a filter. That's a bit of a funny filter here. Um, so this reverb going on here, it's got a couple of parameters, still gonna be working on it, but then all the algorithm settings of the reverb are still up to you to decide how you want them. So there's a few preset uh, mixing matrices here for your reverb, as well as the delay times. 
So you can save that and get as wacky as you want with the modulation and whatever else, and then save the presets by um, selecting the preset and pressing store and recalling them by recalling the preset in this menu. I think this could use a signal boost here. Let's do it from here. Maybe a more percussive patch. And so now the patches are at the end. You do play high keys. How's that work? And delay lines, maybe. So you got reverb going, and same with the delay. You can put that um, also in the single path. And math is going to be mostly how we do most of our mixing over here. So we can just set the combined channels, com combined chops to add. That'll mix our signals. And this has been. And this one as well, we're want to, going to want to make sure that we composite the pixel information out without chop. Uh, is anybody playing around and sort of getting a hang of some of the modules and getting somewhere with it? So that would I, that's definitely what I would recommend at this point, because otherwise I'll just keep messing around, talking. Um, but I definitely want you guys using the components and just sort of seeing where the difficulties might be and what yeah. you might. Um, you know what? I'll spice one up right now. Yeah, have you, have you, okay. You have the pamphlet sound? Yeah, no problem. Um, let's, well, this, this to begin with was sort of like how to get a sound from a MIDI. Okay, you need a sequencer. You don't have any sort of input. Okay, let's do it. So I would start again. Let's delete all this except for audio device out because that's how we output audio. We're going to use the master clock once we find it over here. Next, we're going to use the mono sequencer. It's going to be a monophonic sequencer, which sends out MIDI data over here. And it's going to send the MIDI data to our super synth. Going in here. Oh, and we already have the audio device out. But we're going to just going to hook that up right quick over here. And that's going to be a basic way to get started. And then the synthesizer. So let's have a look at the mono sequencer. So you have the global here for, which lets you know which MIDI channel you want to output. What's the CC number of mod X? 11 and zero, which doesn't make much sense. So let's do 11 and 12. This is a step length. All right, one to eight. This is the root note. So you can start doing cool transpositions here. Um, if you want to design meta sequencers, And this is your scale to which your zero to eight, your um, zero to seven value will be quantized. So here we have a minor scale, I think, and um, yeah, we can just sort of mess around with the scale, and that'll quantize your results and get you musical results slightly faster. You have a row for octaves. You have a row for. Well, you have a row for the notes, forgot that one. And both of these rows are running independently. So you'll have octaves being added at independent lengths, sequences, than your notes. So let's just get like a, maybe an Italo 
disco style bass line here. Okay, and then, so we've got velocity. And ratcheting. And what ratcheting does is essentially repeats a step on that step. Um, so this is a technique from uh, old uh, Moog analog style sequencers in Tangerine Dream. If you guys are familiar with that music, they did a lot of ratcheting and a uh, big fan of the technique. And then here you have the modulation outputs. And the modulation outputs, um, since we've set them on the global page from 11 or 12, we can also set them in the synth as a uh, mod source, say, for our filter. So now you can hear the modulation steps. If we go to one step, always the same value. And now you can hear how I'm affecting the modulation through the sequencers here. Right, and now we're going to start having fun by putting a tempo sync to delay. So we're going to take our dub delay component, add a cross chop, set the setting 0 0.5 for however effect mix you want. Make sure pixel is being displayed and send the input to the dub delay. Get some And you can copy paste the process and have two. You can use a math chop to add the sources by setting the math chop to combine chops, add, and then sending that. And maybe we'll change the patch here to. Uh, And we'll change the root note over here. We'll put it a fifth higher. So we'll do. And you get a bunch of bleep loops. But that's bleep loops in Touch Signer. You can bleep as much as you want to bloop. You can hook up your visuals to it however you want. You can. That's what I'm talking about, about the breakups in audio. A last, last big enemy in audio and touch signer is going to be this timeline. When it loops around, um, it's going to wreak havoc in your network because the time, the time slicing index is uh, going to go out of whack for like that one frame. So that is why I recommend that you have a long timeline length. So here in the master clock, you can send it in, um, you can set it to um, certain lengths just by clicking the time bar, um, bar length, setting it, and uh, whoops, that's how you can get started here. Boop, boop. And we can sync as well again. And a lot of the ways to keep sync, so some of these, so this loop chopper, for example, takes a ramp input, uh, but just from the nature of things, the ramp input has a less, um, has a bit of a gap between the loop when it loops back to from one to zero. So typically, I like simply uh, using the other inputs to re-trigger the loop. Um, so look up. Are you getting a working example at this point and you're up and running? Does anybody else need help getting uh, up and running? Well, for me, like, it, this kind of stuff can work in the working room, right? Like, I mean, like, the working room or those kind of, like, you see, like, some software that is not, like, like this particular, like, thing, thing is doing. Like, I know that the working room, there's also, I think, other software that could work. Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the question is, but you can send out MIDI and you can receive MIDI from Ableton. 
And in touch designer also, there's no, like. No, but like, I mean, I mean, question is like, can you do the exact same work on like Ableton Live? Like I know Ableton Live, they have yeah, yeah. Like, top and stuff. They have like, so those kind of stuff. I mean, this is but like. But I didn't find so those kind of stuff that I can use in those ones. Oh, I, I, I don't really know. Like the idea here is to say Ableton Live. What's that? Like that's I. No, but I mean that's that's the idea. So I like I I, it's it's meant to be like not integrated with any other software except for general for like MIDI MIDI standard, and within Touch Center. But you could like Ableton Live. I mean you can. You you can go to the moon and back compared to this, you know. But, um, but this is here in Touch Center, and if if you have fun with Touch Center, then that's where you want to be. Well, you, you can do this much more with it, for this part, and. Uh, Oh, it is grabbing only a ramp, and it's going back on the basic principles of sequencing that we got over, but that are expanded upon. So the basic principle is, um, well, we've got it over here as well. It's a lookup chop and a pulse chop. So that's the absolute basic for sequencing. Um, lookup chop is going to be at the bottom of everything. But in the mono sequencer, uh, it's a bit more involved, right? And there's polyphonic um, sort of stuff going on. And that's using the count chop. So it's just a ramp. So it's just receiving. You can look inside uh, over here, the master clock. And all you've got are ramps coming out. And just looks up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so concerning the design here, I decided to, I wanted to make the things that sort of like plug and play with each other as much as possible and not have to select channels out or to pay attention to nomenclature too much. Um, there are still some changes that are, need to be made, but that's that's pretty much the kit. Um, yep. Well, if you can, if you synchronize, I think what you're getting at is like, if you use this as your master ramp, then you can get perfect sync with whatever else you're drawing with the visuals. So if you have an, a loop, a video file that has audio, um, take out the loop chopper and then select, unselect audio only. I don't have a loop here. Um, could we make a loop? Um, okay, maybe not right now, but basically this will be an example of how the same lookup ramp is also looking up the index of a movie file. So if you so there's another component that I haven't brought with me today because I need to work it a bit more, but it's an audiovisual looper. So it's just to capture data in nice, really like a um, sort of frame type uh, units, so that then you can re-import that loop and use it in your synchronized music environment. And then you would play it back with a loop chopper, and that would be your audiovisual, the output of one of your projects or whatever you'd put in there, and you'd make yourself a little library and go, and it would chop that up. Yeah, it's it's. I think the basic strategy, if you if you want to like remember something that, I think for me is like, like a a must, is look up ramps. Keep the same ramp. Keep the same ramp and have that doing a bunch of stuff. So ramp zero to one, but uh, like my main project is, um, I use a ramp to look over instances, right? So there's a bunch of information over here, and then the ramp goes zero to one, looks up the instances but it's the same duration and it's the exact same ramp as the one that's looking up musical information. So you'll get, you know, the one-to-one -one tightness that you want. And it's, for me, it's, and also it enables tempo sync very easily because you have musical intervals of the, of the duration of each loop. So, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, you you could, you could. That's a it's like a whole other topic, but we can have quickly over here. So if you have a movie file, or just some strategy, just off the top of the head, what could you do with a movie file? Uh, here's a banana. Um, what could I do with a banana? Uh, you can spin around. 
but how do I make that into music? Um, okay, well, maybe we want to look at what that looks like in terms of channel information by using a top two chop. And we're going to have that uh, crop. We're not going to crop it at all. We're going to take the full image. Perhaps not. Okay, so here's our full image. And you see these little bleeps? Honestly, that's, that's too much information for me, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sum it all together into one channel. Combine channels, add. Okay, so we got, that's a funny curve. That almost looks like our banana. No, that, but that's cool, because then, okay, it's, you notice it's a time slice. Let's do an audio oscillator. Uh, audio oscillator. Here's something I think I skipped over in the pamphlet, but how you can generate sound without time slicing. So we turned off time slicing, and now the same thing. We've got our full range here. Channels, full range. Well, I guess not. Um, let's just see where this gets us. And we can multiply these. Okay, we might want to make sure that the length of the channels match. Uh, how can we do that? Sample rate. We could resample that. So there's a bunch of choose to resample. You could resample at the image itself. But now we're just uh, not time slicing. Uh, sample rate. Move rate, same time range. Same rate, new interval. Samples. Okay, I think we're going to get somewhere here. Right. So you see how now I'm stretching it so that it sort of corresponds to a thing, roughly the same shape. And then we can combine the chops, multiply them. And that's the sound. And then if we, or, ooh, the amplitude, you got to be careful with that though. So we're going to scale that back. Uh, we're gonna Oops. And then, like we saw previously, copy chop for a trigger. And let's see what that sounds like. That's the envelope curve of your banana. So that's just like one way, but the sky's the limit. It's a bit of a silly way, honestly, but it's like, um, yeah, that's it. That's a sound from a banana movie file in, in some way. Yeah. What's going on here? Why? Can uh, let's see. I can go over again uh, basic synthesis, like synthesis signal flow. If that's of interest, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. What time? Yeah, you can just get up and like go to the bathroom whenever. Like, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess for those who want to take a break, you can go. Otherwise, you can just sort of keep. Uh, Chugging away there and then ask some questions. No? Okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to take the synth builder components and, uh, well, should I wait until you return? Are you you're taking a break now? Okay. Well, do you want me to wait until you come back to do the. Okay. Ask, yeah, yeah. Ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would hundred percent be able to do it. Um, have you looked at the voice allocation? If you look inside the super synth, you can sort of trace what your performance is versus the number of oscillators uh, we've got. So we can do that right away. Um, 
Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, well, I think, yeah, but I would, let's get back to it, hold on. Um, audio device in, oh, device out, my bad. Uh, audio device out. You would go here, voice, number of voice, number of voices. Voices, number of unison voices, number four, unison five, which is standard. So I'm going to put a MIDI in just so I can play it from my interface. So the options are here to scale it up as much as you want and down as much. So you can have, right, but you have two oscillators here. If you go in the mixture section, you can turn off one of the oscillators. This is a bit of an experimental feature um, because it deletes one of the pins. That's a new thing for me. Um, but yeah, so now we got sawtooth. We've got wavetables over here. And the wavetables are, okay, well, I guess, yeah, there's still that. Let's see if it's pointing to my, it's not pointing to my right folder. So you want to make sure that it's indexing your, oh, this is nice. That's, uh, okay. Okay. What's going on here? A little bit of pain. Oh, sorry about that. Oh yeah, so you, you know, essentially you want to make sure that's indexing your right, your correct uh, folder, but you've got I've loaded up PPG wavetables in there, and they all play. Um, but to get to your to your answer, it's, it's right there on the voice pages to scale it up. It's still an additive. I uh, know it's in, I mean subtractive mode, right? The whole single path. But yeah, you just scale up the number of voices that you uh, want, and then the thickness of the unison, and then you add an oscillator or two if you want. And uh, if you want to do additive, what you would do, if you wanted to start building your synthesizers out of the basic, uh, this is frustrating. Is um, everything working okay for everyone? Or are there issues like I'm having currently? Yeah, okay, well, yeah, let me know up there. Okay. How oh, you can control sounds? No, no, mini mapper is no, none of that. No, no. Okay, I'm gonna go over it again. Um, no, mini mapper. Never used it. I don't think it's particularly helpful. Like um, dialogs, media device mapper. On this page, check media devices. And then create new mapping. Here I have my Launchpad Pro, which is not working. Here it is working. So MIDI in two, Launchpad Pro. New chop, MIDI in. That's my MIDI information. Now I want a synthesizer. So I'll go for my super synth. We want to match the MIDI channels. So here we can see it's MIDI channel one. And in the super synth component, select MIDI channel one. And we're going to set our audio device out 
I'm going to remember to set it to speakers, put the volume down, and the first output is going to be the, the summed stereo output. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Does it work for you? And I'll have a look. Nobody else got questions for now. Somebody's. Okay. Not on the button. Yeah, these the buttons are. Well, they work, but they're they're individual numbers. So if you want to specifically, they're also the same channel. Mm -hmm. So you might want to change the channel of the buttons. If you know what numbers they are, you can use a rename chop and. Yeah. And then rename those channels to say trigger one, trigger two, trigger three. And, um, but if, if you want to trigger drums, um, mine I can show you how, yeah. actually, where is, is this the folder? So we'll take the drum synth. Over here. Um, we'll find out what our pads are. Uh, you know what, we'll select them. So 45, 2, 52. So you can do CH1N, and you can put the, I might, oh yeah, actually I can. And 45, 2, 52. Select that range. What did I, right? No, I've only got the drum pads. And in the select, there's also already your rename options. And uh, oh man, I can see actually, yeah, there's something changed here, which is not great. The uh, channel names are not KKL Tom. Okay, and we can rename them to the way this has been set up. Is the channel names unfortunately not the ones that are displayed, which is a bit of a mistake there. But we can rename them to uh, Kick L Tom. Uh, oh no, rename Tom. My mistake. Star. So all the channels, and we'll start naming them kick, snare, clap, open, kick, L tom, snare, clap, and tom and conga. And to snare. Last instrument here. Uh, run shot. Run shot clap. Run clap. Yeah, it should be able to plug those in. And then, thing is, if you're working at Touch Center and you get an error, you can know what it is. You can just scroll into the network and say, script error, run type int. Up, 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 up. Select another instrument. I think it'll work without the cowbell for now. It's, it's unfortunate because, actually, it's not. find a more clever way of doing this because uh, these empty channels are these empty channels are just like full on right now mm -hmm. but it's a touch designer so just like uh, pick and choose what you want so I got kick and low tom uh, you can just map those so now I'm just going away from regular functionality but I'm gonna take what, what works so we're in here in there and conga combine chops add
that's my fault. I think I might have broken that. Yeah, no, no. Um, so this is currently just me troubleshooting my stuff, but with the drum sequencer. Gone, so what's the normal control? Oh, yeah, okay. So the error here was the parameters coming in, we've got 16 in total, and I was sending eight channels. Okay. Um, and then that was sort of messing up a bit the math down the line. So to get back to this, again, you can rename them, but you can also merge them times two, and then you'll get that many numbers. And you'll just want to find a way to create 16 channels of which eight are your drum triggers. Okay. Uh, so this, I think, again, the names won't be good. I don't want to rename them following that. So I can keep at it. I can, yeah, that's it. No, let's just do it. Let's just act, get it working here. So, constant. I'm gonna make eight channels. Can be named. Just put the viewer. Right now, we're just finding a way to press a button and like trigger a jump, uh, based on this component. Because otherwise, you could create your own just circuit entirely. Sorry, any of that. So uh, I'm gonna go. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, that's really silly. There we go. Okay, I do have an error here, but there's nothing to it. Oh, it's okay. So this is missing the other channel. Which I'm try to into it. Clap. So that's pretty much exactly what I meant about in my threshold thing. I have to, in this component specifically, mm -hmm. make sure the nomenclature is like a back in tight there, but now you should okay, and you want to make sure that those actually aren't in what's being sent out in your MIDI. Um, so you can use a delete chop. Delete channels by channel name. Add. Let's reload. 
there is no play. Like, again, some results here. If I put the volume down, so now I want to check here. Yeah. Example is not over here. Okay. In terms of OSC renaming for MIDI, I'm not, uh, I'm not an OSC. Okay, yeah, so you can rename those as straight up channels. Okay. So what are these? So one slash push one. Uh huh. Okay, but rename from is going to be anything coming in, and then you're just going to write all the. We want to keep the number. Change the first part. Oh, you want one okay. slash push. But the number. Can one. The MIDI note six is going to be a bit of a, like you're not going to use that. It's going to be too low. So you just have to add six. No. Um, well, depending if this is your limited keyboard, I would scale yeah. it entirely. Yeah, okay. So I would name it to what would be like maybe 62 to, yeah, exactly. no, to 72. 72 yeah. yeah, so the channel names are, uh, okay, where are we going? From we push? From here, and then you just say okay. push two. Okay, so we can still do that. Yeah, but let's go with the, so I just yeah. want to see what the name is, slash push one. And this is two okay. push. So it would be one, uh -huh. slash. I know, so don't read the, <laughs> it's in, you know, um, yeah. So, okay, I'll tell you how to type there. Uh, so okay. it's one slash uh -huh. push, uh -huh. and then the range, so square bracket, open square bracket, uh -huh. uh, one, uh -huh. open, um, so, I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, is no, yeah. Um, dash. yeah, dash 24, uh -huh. and then rename from star, from all the channels there, uh -huh. and then C yeah, CH1. Uh -huh. So this, you're actually going to have to make an expression. So. You click on the small arrow here, you go to the blue box. So CH1, uh, CH1N plus. That's a string, right? Yeah, actually, you didn't need to make any expressions. Sorry. But don't try it anyways. Um, square bracket. Uh, and then what was the range? You said 60 to 72. So 60 dash 72. Right, and that's not going to be what we want. So we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of. The, um, we'll get rid of the quote. plus, we'll get rid of the quote, and then we'll make it a normal, just normal. Uh, yeah. Get rid of the plus. Yeah, get rid of the dash, and then just oh, make yeah. that a normal, just that's the, the yeah, value. One note. And that's the, yeah. Okay. So, oops. Copy paste that. Uh huh. Why it's not copy? Let me copy yeah. with the. Uh, and then in rename too, but in the regular just string entry, not the expression entry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, now why aren't you getting? Oh, your timeline is paused. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh look, it works. But now this is not registering. Mm -hmm. It's in channel there. eleven. I moved it. Oh okay. Yeah, and it wasn't. Uh, there you go. Okay, cool. Yep. Oh, you're getting a lot of, yeah, a lot of channels coming up here. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of channels going in there, so that's unusual. Let's have a look here. Okay, okay right, there's two inputs here. Ooh. And also, I see that the channels are bouncing around here. Um, and your frame rate's super down. Dub delay. Okay. So there's something being sent to the effect loop. The blue inputs here are effect loops. More important. Oh, sorry, it's, it's going to happen a lot now because it's inverse to what I'm used to. Uh, so you can look at your channels coming in. Correct, it's correct. Oh, this is not what you want here in an audio, right? You're getting all this information now. Okay, I think you're getting sequencer information into your audio. That's probably this, yeah. And then, uh, you know, you can plug in your other synth here. 
but as well, if it's if it's all crackly and stuff, that's very normal. Your frame rate is completely down, so oh, you won't okay. enter performance mode. And then, uh, I uh, it should be F one function F one maybe. Yeah, performance mode, and that's how it hides all the network. So it doesn't need to compute all the UI, and okay. it only computes what's going in the thing. And then that that's how you measure the type of results you're getting. Mm -hmm. um, but your results may vary. You have a lot of components going on right now, so there's still like a hard limit. Maybe I should just like. Yeah, it's still like a hard limit to these things. You won't be able to go like all hand for for a while, but uh, mm. but you can get you know creative and maybe like just make one nice audio visual synth patch kind of thing and scale it depending on what your computer is capable of. And if they ever get the process thing that they came out with, which would run another instance on another thread, then this starts becoming a lot more powerful as well because you're not allocating necessarily all those CPU resources. Um, to your visuals, which you're doing. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Mm -hmm. The three notes? Oh, you could set like a. Uh, three notes, yeah. Yeah, the RGB. Well, let's have a. notes but there's three notes in space like that uh, so I want to add all the samples I think um, I mean this is this is the sort of stuff where that's like that's where people get creative you know like you got to think okay well what's the information how am I using necessarily and right now I'm thinking um, you'd have like what you could have is again a look up going over here and then uh, You'd have maybe another image looking up for uh, uh, ramp. Uh, boop, boop, boop. No, I got there. And then look up, and then this is you'd rename. Then you'd get notes. Mm -hmm. But it's not you know the link between the image, given that this has its own movement, is not obvious. But maybe say if you use right transform, I see it has a thing in here already. So maybe if you used the null here, let's see. And range 90. Mm -hmm. Then that's like a way of reusing data in a way that's a bit more blimp, 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 blimp. It's a bit more sync this way. Mm -hmm. But, um, what I would probably do is I would, yeah, same thing. I w it wouldn't be so much the moving banana that would give me issue. I would still scan it from left to right with a lookup. This result over here, and these would be maybe trigger channels or whatever intensity. I think there's someone, um, there's probably people here who do a lot of, I, yeah, who do some some cool stuff with like audio visualization, the um, specifically. Uh, escape. Uh, this is a Mac thing. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, this is Selena's gone now. As soon as she comes back, tell her permission denied. No idea. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a weird thing. Uh, on this file? In this file, you, yeah, you might lose it. Um, Just wait till Celine. She's like the bug hunting person, so she'll be like, "Ooh, interesting," you know. So, do you guys want to get into some like synth theory with the building blocks there, the synth builder components? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Synth Builder over here. Here are all your blocks. Um, so we saw previously in the like pamphlet a really basic synthesizer voice with some modulation to the filter, some modulation to the pitch. And in terms of modules, again, just using these, um, the first thing in a synthesizer is going to be voice allocation. 
So early synthesizers, you would have one voltage coming in, and when same with like your rack, you got your voltage coming in and a trigger that says, well, it, it triggers an envelope generator, CV and gate, yeah, CV and gate. But when you started getting into polyphonic synthesizers, you had like early computers that were, um, you would have multiple instances of the same circuit, but you would have to find a way to get um, the keyboard information going to the appropriate circuit at the appropriate time. So that's, that was the voice allocation algorithm. And then so in this case here, it's the voice allocator. There's an error here because MIDI channel is zero, which is, doesn't exist. Um, let's see, no, no error. So that's our voice allocator over here, which takes in MIDI information coming in. So you set the channel and uh, starts going. And then afterwards, particularly this voice allocator will send out triggers when it functions. Uh, from the, No, the bottom one, I think it's labeled uh, unison modulation. So that one is for modulating the unison parameter. Right. So now you have, uh, he has a bug. His permission is denied. Yeah. So now you've got triggers coming out here from the trigger output. And the triggers typically you'll send to an envelope generator. In this case, the multi-envelope, which wires itself for us, which is nice. And this gives us what's going to be the basic contour of our sound. So in TouchSigner in general, if you want to see what's going on with your channels, you can always plug in a trail chop or compare channels. And you can see that these are our envelopes going out. So fun thing about the multi-envelope uh, particularly is that um, you can shrink it or make it longer depending on um, either velocity or the key range. Or you can simplify it and it'll just be the same throughout the range. So the trigger, then we need a sound source. So we're going to use an oscillator. So TouchSigner has a built-in audio oscillator chop, which is this is built around. Currently, the error message is here. If you get an error message, you can look at what it is. I know straight up that it's always these uh, file references. So I'm going to try doing that again. I know that this is not, but this happens, and it's not pleasant. So we're going to ignore that error message for now, but it's just the file references in here that it's not finding. Um, so if you're having those errors, you want to link the your wavetable folder to your wavetable folder, your sample folder to your sample folder, etc. So now we have an oscillator and an envelope generator. And to really get out of the woods really quick and have workable sort of sound sources, we can immediately use a VCA. And then we'll get bright, buzzy tones all the time. No control over tone other than the oscillator. But we'll start getting... Um, Sounds we can use the panning amplifier in the oscillators, and we look here, and it's the amplitude modulation input where we'll put our triggers. And now we'll look at the result of that, which is not the uh, impressive. We'll change this to our analog waveforms, and you can see that we have sound. But these sounds are going to be relatively stale, very bright, depending on the harmonic content of our oscillators. So typically, you also include a filter. Here we have um, the dual filter module. Pops up here. And uh, I suppose this error shows up again. If you see this, it's because we're using the Chan index class, which says per Chan index this value, but then it's looking at null 19, which doesn't have any channels. So that's something I'll make sure to work on more. So now we've got our oscillator going into a filter 
which is being multiplied, going into an amplifier, being multiplied by the envelope generator. And then we can change the characteristics of the sound. Actually, we can start outputting sound now so we can hear it with an audio device out. So now we can change the timbre of the sound. with the filter. And we can have one filter or two filters, depending on the mixer settings. Here I'm only going for a single filter. Well, the UIs, all the UIs here are, um, they're based on custom parameters, because the idea is that you would use them in, a, uh, in an audiovisual project. So you can export to them, you can use your meta modules in them. Um, and you can start building them within the touch designer environment, and the, the UI would be at the end result of that specific project. So the custom parameters is the UI um, for these things in particular. Uh, before, um, people who were trying to do touch sound, um, sound in touch designer specifically would often bump up the frames per second so that they could get higher resolution modulation on exports and stuff, but that's something I decided to completely avoid just because the bottom line is you still want to be doing to have some sort of video output at the end of the day. So, so now I've got a filter with a bunch of inputs over here. And um, the green inputs are the typical, go straight to the cutoff input, the second input of the audio filter. So that's normal to use. That's going to work. The other ones are using the Mechan index class to get polyphonic values from the resonance and the slope, etc. So that uses a bit of scripting, um, which hasn't been thoroughly bug tested yet. It mostly works, but um, I'm finding new stuff every day. So now we've got the envelope also going into the filter at the same time as the panning amplifier. So it should get brighter as it gets louder. Oops. And if I want to change the amount of that modulation, then you can always use a math chop. And you can multiply or divide the amount. So now we're going to go for twice the amount. Uh, we're going to change waveform as well for something a bit buzzier here. So we'll soft. We could even invert it by doing negative 2 modulation. So now as the sound gets quieter, it gets brighter. So now we've built the synthesizer voice. Um, if we wanted to more thickness, we could double up the oscillator. We could go in, use our dual mixer. Automatically wires the two oscillators. Pretty nice. And then plug that into our filter. I want to get back that get that back to two. So now we've got oscillators an octave apart. We can ring modulate them. And we can modulate the mix polyphonically with our envelope. We can have another envelope for our mix specifically. We can change the waveforms. And uh, that's the sort of synthesis I'm really enjoying out of this system, is this sort of, let's see if this. Anyway. Uh, so now we're just mixing, you know, from a bright sawtooth to a sine wave into a filter with like more or less like interesting results. They're just, they're the results we're getting right now. Um, but then what I find also, oh yeah, and if you want cyclical modulation, we've got the LFO synth builder component over here. Uh, and let's do that, let's actually do this to the mixer. Uh, LFO components can have phase out amounts um, 
yeah, you can change the phase per voice. You can also set it to stereo, which is what I'm going to try to get to right now. And hopefully, yeah, that hopefully that'll work without too much of a hiccup. So we'll start by changing the panning amplifiers mode to stereo. We'll change our oscillator modes to stereo. This is like a, just generally speaking, that's like a pretty unusual feature uh, that I think is pretty nice. Stereo voice paths. Yeah, so this is, the, there's a new synth coming out that has it, but this also has it. So now you can see the double, the number of oscillators has uh, been modified. And then we're going to set our LFO as well to stereo. The phase is going to set be set at 0.5, and that should fade the sawtooth and the sine wave to both speakers. Maybe it's doing it. Uh, seem so much we so so now the fun thing with touch just with the UI you can go and see what's going on so the way stereo works is that you'll do all your channels and for the right channel so zero to four because we've got four voices and then we'll go to the other one so if we just pause this to find out if it's working um, we find that this is our channel zero which is paired up with four we find that they're identical so I'm not getting the result that I want from this currently uh, our mouth, LFO. Uh -huh. uh, uh, uh. We can do it with something a bit more obvious, maybe with the filter disconnect. Uh, currently, yeah. it's hard to tell from what. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I'm trying to see if the filter modulation is stereo. It should be like, that's what the phase. The phase is offset by 0 0.5, and we've set the mode to panning. Um, there's also, so there's also panning in here. So if I want to set that LFO or just our envelope, these are gonna get just wacky sounds. To... But you can set the panning amount. And you can mix that, say, with the. Now we're getting into weird synthesizer. This is the like the power of having a modular format. Um, we can use the pitch of the sound to determine the panning position of each voice. Uh, so we're going to use the use and pan auto out trigger keyboard mod out which per voice, depending on the keyboard mode, will scale from minus one to one. So we'll put that in our, yeah, so this definitely is panning and we'll go to the other octave. So that's um, panning modulation for the keyboard position. And if you wanted to get fancy, you can have polyphonic aftertouch being output here. Actually, I think we have it to the LFO um, frequency. Do we? Oh, it's the amplitude, sorry, one, and then the mod amount is going to be two. So you have polyphonic articulation um, where you can keep going with that stuff. Uh, those, are those all the synth components? Yeah, no, if you want to get uh, really cool, in my opinion, you can use the vector mixer, which is if you have four oscillators, you can get a um, uh, kind of like the, Def yeah, like the WaveStation D50, uh, so it's, but it's straight for the oscillators. So it's vector mixing, and this one only works with the input um, zero to one input for, I think, X in and Y input. So there's no interface there. Um, so you can start going with that. Is there anything? And so the super synth packages a certain architecture of these modules together, but with a uh, parameters one level on top. And oh yeah, the last part would be 
uh, functions. So these are inspired by uh, Kurzweil synthesizers who have these, they're called uh, funds. And so you take two sources and then you have access to all your functions and that's a way of mixing signals and uh, yeah. So there's some, so they're not all there, but there's some, there's like sample and hold from here. Um, there's min max um, functions. So whichever modulation source is the highest will be output. There's a minimum function, et cetera. So you can have those and those in the super synth are typically what you would use maybe to control uh, um, modulation depth with a mod wheel, right? So you would multiply the mod wheel amount to uh, the LFO and then you can control the amplitude of the LFO by the amount of mod wheel. So if you're looking at the super synth, which is the level on top, you go into functions, mod wheel, function A times B, B is uh, LFO1, and then in your pitch, in your oscillator menu, in pitch modulation, you would set that to function one. And then you would be able to bring in the vibrato, and um, et cetera. And then you could do that polyphonically as well. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a complete synthesis setup there. Yeah. Yeah. VCV, yeah, well, for sure. <laughs> there's no question. Yeah, there's no question. Um, and it's free. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's great. It's super great, uh, but it's not a touch designer. And then the, the, end, the bottom line, though, is that you, I do want people to hook this up to visuals, right? It, it works. It works as a really nice keyboard, actually, as well, just the super synth. It, it works, but you've still got all this CPU cycles and the GPU that's untouched for just like cramming out the visuals that are polyphony, uh, polyphonically articulated. Um, and so those sorts of polyphony can be like a, a leap motion, they can be connect channels, they're whatever is multiple channel inputs. Yeah, well, I know, it's because you didn't, you didn't. I get it because, I mean, I just spent like hours building it, so I would use it, but <laughs> like I, I understand the difference. Huh? Uh, no, not yet. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, system there, the whole thing. Yeah, it's like a, the audio visual components are coming in, but those are my personal sort of tools. Yeah, to match up there. Huh? I nothing ready. It's like deep in old files. I'm like, oh, is it uh, the final file for this cool thing two or three or the the I forget the names because it's been I haven't touched visuals now in the uh, in a while. Um, yeah, I can show you one example, which is gonna look kind of. I'm gonna show you an example. Yeah, quit. This is one that I what widget workshops. Where is it? go oh here we go okay let's try this okay so this looks really bad right now and just it's not uh let's see where the engine out one let's see Window, I want to get that. Let's use this. Um, so, roughly speaking, the idea here is to have in my full performance setup it's four tracks drum track, bass line, um, pads and stabs, so a four voice polyphonic, and then uh, arpege arpeggiated sort of sprinkly notes, uh, which are maybe duophonic. And in the visual correspondence to this, the polyphonic parts are these squiggly lines here. Uh, do we have audio out? Audio device out. Um, I'm 
So if you have the speakers in front of you, it's just left to right and the panning channels are going. Um, I just tried to dig this up really quickly, but I think well, it's still sort of fading out. Um, but then you'd have control over the synth. These could be used as masks to like a more interesting background layer than what's going on currently. But we can have an example of what happens if we So that's like just, it's not, you know, it's not a great example, but it's showing you how you can spatialize, how stereophonic sound, stereo polyphonic sound can be shown on screen. That was just like, there's one idea. So you'd have a hard time doing that unless you had four instances of the same synth and had a way to split it from going to Ableton and back. <laughs> so it's like kind of niche, but but yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that without some uh, some sort of MIDI parser. Yeah, that's the, the idea or the table itself of information. The idea is that you are using, you're sacrificing these CPU cycles for the audio generation. You can be content that audio is like half the information. You're like, well, that's great. You're getting somewhere, but then, um, the idea is still like you got to reuse that um, that information to be efficient for it to like actually make more sense than simply generating audio inside a touch for the sake of it. Because you know if you pipe out the Ableton, there's a great tool to do it, and uh, you'll be able to use whichever VST and like hundreds of banks of professional presets and like uh, analog flavored compressors, etc., and get great results. But if you start getting clever and reusing the information, I think for me that's the interest. Or another point would be. Um, uh, the user interface of these instruments in a beautiful animated touch designer context, and that would be something you might project. So you might have your whole performance laid out on a touch screen, but you make it sort of flashy and beepy, so you can send it up on a screen, people can see what you're doing, and you've got a little bit of a light show that looks like a Star Trek L cars or whatever. You know? yeah, so that would, those are some ideas of how um, I would think of incorporating these tools in the touch designer practice. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Talk to Stanislav. Um, he's a Russian guy. He looks very Russian techno goth styles. Um, huh? Glasov. Yeah. Yeah. He's a uh, extreme. Just under extreme course number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 100% talk to him because he's he's right in there, yeah yeah, and you'll be able to geek out on modules as well. Yeah. Are we uh, at time here? We still got. Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, if you guys are still working on stuff, I can still troubleshoot while we're here. But it looks like uh, we're a bit. Uh, I think we're before schedule, but. Not yet. They're going to be for sale on my Etsy store. So they're workshop participants. They get a sneak peek. They have them. I, I just ask they don't use them on corporate projects. Um, they're going to be on sale on Etsy. And uh, that's it. You know, um, there's like another module. It's not in here yet. The AV Looper. But that's coming up as well. If you guys haven't used the Loop Chopper either, I think that one's like really bananas. But if, if you like breaks. Yeah. I just build them. It's like I get to the bottom of things. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Like, not so much. It's like you you learn the. No, it's not. It's crazy scripting. Like you know, my programming chops could always be a bit better. Um, but you get better as you do things. So this is not my first super synth. It was super synth like two years ago, um, but it had limited. Um, it had like it was stuck to eight voices, right? And then I would think, how do I scale it up? So then I rebuilt the algorithm. There's a lot of process of rebuilding after you've learned something and it goes faster and faster. But I find in all project workflows, there's always that time where, okay, you're working, you're adding features, you're adding features, but then you've also been learning in the process. And by the time you're adding these new features, 
the old stuff you built it on, like the whole foundation, you're like, this is garbage and I hate it, <laughs> you know? So you just start over and it goes twice as fast and it's better. Um, so there's been a lot of that going on in a lot of these. And like even today earlier, I saw the drum synth. I was like, oh yeah, the nomenclature is like a bit uh, not so great. And um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I guess like I know synths, so signal path stuff wasn't too difficult for me. And then through learning touch signer, you just sort of, once you learn what the caveats are with audio, um, you work around them. And uh, you get, like, I think I got usable results, especially on just the synth side. Um, I haven't demonstrated the sample option because I'm of the file selection menu, which gets a bit weird. But normally you select samples, let's go here, and it populates your menu. And these samples can be um, whatever you want them to be. So what I like is you can get a dense recording of your, your rack setup if you're going for these crazy dense drones or whatever else, and you plop that in, then you can play it polyphonically and you can cross mod it with the other oscillator or get your filters in there, however. There's also the one shot mode, which is for if you want to add a percussive element to the beginning of your sound, but that's iffy. That one's like brand new and um, it's iffy, but I it's because the audio file in is sort of weird. When you Q pulse it, you'll miss the transient. It sort of fades it in. So, um, let's don't know how much else. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, there's a okay. Yeah, if you guys have a Launch Control XL, I said that in the emails I sent out. But just it makes sense to get one. Uh, there's this component is free online if you just want to go grab it, and I'll see if I can set up really quickly, because these things are like one hundred and fifty dollars over here. One hundred fifty dollars used. Um, so robust, good quality, but RGB feedback. And then if you download my component, dialogs, new device mapper, create new mapping, launch control Excel, launch control Excel. Okay, we're going. I think we got stuff here. Check the MIDI channel. All right, okay, so now we've got feedback back on the screen. Um, I don't, I need to reinitialize it to get the LEDs working. So the LEDs on the top are working. The ones on the bottom, not so much. I think I'm going to go to uh, new device mapper. I think I'm going to go for this one. Launchpad, I think this one might work better. Never sure. Okay, yeah. So, okay, now we've got the colors going. Yeah, it's a bit uh, just the way it is. But you can see the colors on screen. You can change presets, and those will change the banks. And then to take control of this and maybe set up radio group buttons or momentary buttons or have counts the number you change in the LED feedback, well, the groundwork's all laid out for you. So you got eight presets. You go down here. If you want to take care of the LED, just change the colors over here as long as it's red or green. And uh, the rest of the scripting is taken care of. These buttons, if you want to set up radio groups, you go like this, uh, layout, button, toggle up, momentary, exclusive. You set your radio group like that and you start customizing from there. Um, so highly recommended. This one's free. And uh, that's like a starting point as well. What I was saying about maybe user interfaces themselves can be put up on screen. This one looks just like not spectacular and flashy, but it sort of shows you that you can get stuff that reflects what the performer's actions are on screen. Same with the knobs, those work. And if you're setting up sequencers, well, then you can start animating the knobs as well just by animating um, your tops over here. So this is your output. So if you start animating this, you'll have the feedback on your controller. And there's also one for the Launchpad Pro that I did some years ago. I have to go back through it. But the same thing, you just throw up a top and then you see it on the pixels and then you have like a preset management system. Um, so I think these are good tools for um, both for music in general and even more so for the sort of cross-platform audiovisual touch signer stuff. Uh, do you have any questions?
That's funny. I think we're running out of steam very quickly. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um pardon? Between blocks control signals, the sixty frames per second. Uh it's mostly good enough for most things. All the chops, you want to make sure that your sample rate is correct, right? But you don't want to you want to avoid exports. So say you want to multiply signals with a math chop, don't export to the gain parameter. Uh use the second input and then you can change keep the sample rate throughout so that's very important um, yeah no no in the math chop so so I can show you right now uh, audio oscillator and this is really like this is the basic troubleshooting stuff okay uh, let's stop that So you can see the sample rate, 44.1. Got a math chopped. And now I'm going to make two mistakes in one. And say I want to modulate the amplitude. Two mistakes in one. I want to mod modulate it uh, cyclically with a ramp. Three mistakes in one. I'm not using a null chop. Huh? That's so this is terrible in three ways. First of all, the fact that we're exporting to that we're exporting to a parameter means that this um, the update of this value will be done at the frame rate of the session, which is 60 frames per second. Second mistake is that our LFO is 60 frames per second regardless. So even if we fix this by uh, using the inputs and setting them to um, chops multiply, it looks fine here. But if we listen to it, uh, let's get the amplitude down here, you'll hear the typical sort of like, oh, I'm going to try to do audio in test center and it sounds like garbage uh, mistake, which is this one. OK, well, like that clicking's normal. Let's go for a sine wave. It's actually not so bad. <laughs> OK, but if we go to, that's not so bad, but if we go to 30, that's the mistake, right? And so the way you so even at thirty, the way you go around that is sample rate, and you set it something higher. Smooth, right? So you can do that for frequency modulation, and a bunch of different audio applications. Just make sure your sample rates are correct. There's another. In some chops, uh, in some other ones, nope. I think the, they mostly got it on this one, but there's there's like some instances where like oh this one. It's like a legacy job, so it was a while ago, and, and that wasn't there. It's my impression, at least. Um, so that's the big issue with sound and touch signer that a lot of people uh, won't get. Um, there's, and then once you start digging deeper, there's a couple of other ones, such as making sure that the audio information downstream is getting referenced by pixel information at the output. Yeah, so that, like, so sometimes, especially with delay uh, networks, you want to make sure, like I have a, let's see, uh, InfiniVerb. This is, this is pretty exciting for me, this one with the, plus. So let's see if we can make this uh, do the error. Maybe a bit crackly. Anyways, the error is the you want to make sure to reference a pixel here. So we're going to composite. Just there's like a tap out for a single pixel here that you can composite with your output, and then you'll have smooth delays and smooth reverbs all the time. Uh, add and make this. Maybe not so smooth there. It should be. 
Okay, network editor is a different story. That there's like no way around. Bit of crackling there. Um, it's not always the case, but sometimes it just is. Uh, but that's so that's another trick um, when you're getting those error messages. A last thing you can do is for certain operations, such as if you go into the wavetable oscillator here. I'm not like I haven't really thoroughly tested this to see how how efficient it is, but you can set things in their own basis and add component time. The problem is if you're doing this with audio and you're trying to get the audio out from that component, it's going to be all messed up with the time slicing because it'll have its own time slicing settings. So you can't pass audio through it, but you can do certain, um, certain operations such as uh, taking care of your wavetables uh, you know, and cross operations by doing that trick. But like I haven't had too many cases in which that's, that's really the case. Uh, And uh, yeah. I think now for <laughs> for the time it's left, I think I'm just gonna put in together like a, a full little studio there using all the modules and then see see where I get. And I think that's gonna be it. Just a couple of new guys there. And uh, okay, I'm gonna get rid of this. Get rid of that. Do four track mixer. Reverb. Let's do a loop chopper. Go for dub siren. Dub delay. For another double A. Let's put it over here. Have a loop chopper. I only have one noise, so let's get that. Uh, dub siren. Mono sequencer. Here. Let's do the same. Dub siren. Now let's just let's see what we've got in these sequencers. Um, let's go here. You got sends on the mixer I didn't show for, so each got sends, so this should send to a delay. Oh, actually, hold on. The crackling is part of the game. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. In perform mode, you should be able to get consistent results, but crackling in session, definitely part of the game. What we got here? That's correct. Should be correct.
I think one of the yeah, I think one of the issues I was having was that this um, the whole network was nested, and I think that might play into some yeah that might play into some issues. Uh, so let's get this up, parameters. Let's get this up as well. Double A. Okay, drag and drop not working so much. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh, did I get this up? Parameters? All right, let's just see. So that way you just go and troubleshoot and you'd probably find the solution there. Not super satisfied with the crackling there, but uh... oh, okay. So that's it. So here's the problem, because we're troubleshooting, we're learning what can go wrong, and I'm like, there's crackling, and it's you know, normally you might want to give up because you're like, oh damn, it's crackling again. But there is there actually is a solution every time when there's crackling. So here it is. So this empty input here, um, what's probably going on is that there's some like non-zero value being added to the total, which is giving us like uh, not the smooth audio. So we can just undo. Let's see what's going on here by looking into the chops. Uh, 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 and it's going to be in these. Yeah, it's going to be in these inputs coming in here. I think it's going to be. This is going. Oh, does anybody see the problem? I've said it like maybe seven times in the lecture. Does anybody see the problem? This is like, this is key. This is really key because we just had this crackling for a while and I was getting disappointed and sad. But I, I can fix it. Need to have pixel information. It's pointing to something. And, uh, it's a bit better. So it's going to be a bit better. I think also launch control Excel. Normally I would recommend having this in a separate instance for the UIs because it does cook quite a bit when you turn a knob. Um, but that was like an issue that as well, if you're getting crackling, you want to make sure you're pointing at pixel information. You're making sure that you don't have fixed uh, non time sliced channels going out. And uh, we got to And the last error you're going to get is when the timeline loops around. So here you have a feature just to set it to a ridiculously long length, right? Because when the index loops around, then you're going at zero index and the previous channels don't know where to follow up to. So that's why you set a long timeline so you can avoid that.
yeah, don't, don't, uh, let's listen to the reverbs, I suppose. Let's get, uh, I think, yeah, I think, so another issue, huh? Um, there's still something for sure. Another issue could be the sample rate because we were doing panning. I just saw in that patch and the LFO might have been going a bit high, but also the network open is like not. Yeah, let's see. And also I think, I think we're going from zero to one in the envelopes like this, I should limit a bit. Let's go smaller envelope. Um, yeah, so envelope value is going from zero to one really quickly. I think I should put a small limit on that because that'll inevitably be, be a click. Uh, as much as I like this component, I think that's given us some problems as well. Uh, so try to get some notes, maybe something nicer, something nicer than that, something slower. So it's set up, we're setting up a flanger, kind of. A bit loud. So you got different units and modes. It takes it takes a bit of patience to get nice sequences. Like this one's a bit uh, a bit nonsense there, but uh, uh, let's see. Let's cool it with the octaves. That's gonna need to cool it. Uh, playing with the parameters cooks more than having real time input from another source. Um, so, so you'll get some artifacts when I move these, but. sounds you can get, you can sync the LFOs. Let's try to get the panning again. Yeah, if I could get the it's a square wave there.
So uh, that's the kit thus far. It demands to be like played around with. Still figuring out the small caveats there. I have gotten better results than I feel like I'm currently displaying, but uh, that's the brakes. And uh, that's pretty much, yeah, I think that's like the, my, so far, I think kind of the best efforts in like comprehensive audio production in, in Touch Center. So it's still a, still a bit of the dark, bit of a bit of a black box still. Cool, yeah, cool. Is that it? Oh. Neat. Well, TD Ableton is probably going to be strictly better. <laughs> well, because you're using Ableton, which is another, like, you know, 600. Uh, it depends on the scale of the project, I would say. Um, but this, say, say there was a workshop um, yesterday with Collisions and TD Ableton. This, I, I would be confident in saying that that would be a much better use for, uh, like, this built-in synth than TD Ableton because, well, depending on if you're at the collision, I don't know if the collision chop is taken up like tens of milliseconds of like computing time. But if we just look through also at the sort of the computing time of these things, uh, let's see. Yeah, see, so the reverb I could have put at half resolution and um, your children cook time. Oh, yeah. This one's a bit expensive because uh, it's got four stereo delay limes, right? So this one's almost up a millisecond. That's the expensive one. The dub delays, which gets you in reverb territory, much cheaper. Um, the super synth, it depends on how many voices you're using. and um, But it depends on how many voices. Here we're using f two oscillators, four voices, and four unison stacks. Four times four times four, yeah. So, so 24, or 64. 64 oscillators, so that's like a heavy patch, right? But you can scale down, you can get rid of the oscillator. Uh, there's only one filter now, and voices, if you were to make it monophonic, take unison off. Um, and Right, you've reduced, now you've got a monophonic synthesizer with one oscillator, one filter, two ADSRs, two LFOs, for 0 0.6. That's usable, like definitely. Oh, that's the troubleshooting process there. You got to do the uh, this little performance monitor all the time. There's also people have built individual tools. There's the probe tool in the palette. But this you run through, you see what you're using. On average, the full kit, I think, well, we can find out this whole thing. The one with, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, here we're running at 6.18 on an i7 from three years ago. Uh, yeah, the idea is all on the CPU pretty much. Like, you, there's, you know, there's a lot of things you could do on the GPU, um, but typically audio is not done on the GPU, and I was trying to avoid wacky solutions, such as, like, high frame rates. Like, just want to avoid wacky solutions, make it in a way that makes sense. You can trace it if you have a touch sign or a background. And then the GPU is still completely there for you to flex it hard, you know? And you've got the data, it's whatever's there, just get in there and get it. I didn't know that there was, but it's yeah, probably amazing. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to look into it, but that was sort of a, not the design I was going for. Like, there's a lot of. There's another guy who's doing sound on the GPU, and you can look at some of his solutions. Like, for example, if you do a delay line on the, G on the GPU using feedback, you're never going to have crackling because Touch Designer just prioritizes that process. So that was like, I was like, oh, damn, it works. It works a lot better. And then I figured out if you just output a pixel, it'll get good results as well. Um, yeah, so that's... Uh, Uh, yeah, it's a sample. So this was, 
at the beginning of the workshop, I tried to go through the basic principles. And uh, one of them was playing back audio files. Playing back audio files, audio file in is I just, if you get and build your own audio playback component, you can mess up the ramp. So then in this case, we've got, I'm just going to bring this one up. So that's your break. That's the break in normal. And now we're going to mess it up. And then vinyl, maybe. OK, and then the way that works is this. Now there's clicks just because of sample. This is, again, a mistake I need to fix, but it's uh, because now I'm running 12 slices because it's a three bar pattern. So there's little clicks here. But if I take, say, another presets, uh, So you lock up the ramp. But but that index that index goes to the movie file. So if you have a movie file in, I don't, I would be nice. It's the same thing. Forwards, backwards, etc. Uh, and then if you want to get in precise, then here's your table. So I could do Yeah, and then so you can save the preset. I can change it. Yeah, and then okay, it's this will probably be more reliable than the. And then. Level sent. Oh yeah, here, okay, no, this is really cool. Um, so I guess, uh, the bit crusher, right. So there's an output on this module as well, which is just for effect control output. So this should add a, another dimension. So it controls as well. There's also a ramp being output here to a control unit to a bit crusher. And the bit crusher is also an audio visual component. So that's, that's one of them. So if you're sending your audio file out, it will also pixelate that one. And, uh, and that's on the last tab of the remix. It's the effect output amount. And there's other, there's other components you can modulate with that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's it. Ready to do visuals now. Yeah, looking forward to it. That'll be nice. All right, thanks for coming, guys.